Welcome to the Non-Fungibles podcast, episode 41. I'm Luke. And I am George. And today we speak to Tagachi, a Solidity developer and security researcher with decades of experience building software. We focus on security and in particular wallet security, covering what Tagachi deems as best practice from a hyper-secure standpoint. There are so many thinking points covered in this episode, I think it's pretty essential listening for anyone who interacts with crypto or NFTs. Before we begin, we have just one announcement to make. The next non-fun gerbil will be Pepe Gerbil. And for this, we have a very special guest, Pepe Langelo. For those who don't already know the name, you will almost certainly recognise the iconic oil paintings she makes, rethinking traditional artworks with Pepe the Frog. Check out our post on Twitter or Discord for the details, but there will be personalised, hand-painted Pepe gerbils up for grabs. So, thinking caps on and get those backstories flowing. Now on with the episode. Welcome to the Non-Fun Gerbils podcast, the show about digitally scarce gerbils, non-fungible assets, and the growing decentralised economy. We are the Okay, so we are here with Tagachi, who is a Solidity developer and a security researcher. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Thanks for having me. We have been working towards doing a, a cover it all security podcast because there's increasing amounts of people getting hacked and people giving away their NFTs and losing access to their NFTs. It's, it's literally happening every day now. And it seems to me that this subject isn't getting covered well enough. So hopefully we can contribute towards reducing the amount of people who are having these problems. So maybe we could start with a little bit about you and what your background is. Right. So I have been a developer for the last 25 odd years. And from the beginning, I, I wanted to find out whether there are any other ways people can get in into damaging my clients. Uh, one of my favorite movies was Terminator. And like I was always thinking like whether there can be anything that a person can do to use a system that can work against the user. So this idea about hacking was not very much present. Like, you know, uh, late 1990s, but Still, viruses were picking up, uh, and with Yahoo being the most widely used service, uh, spreading spam links, phishing links. I, I, I don't think we, we had anything called phishing at that moment, but at least sending a link that can damage a person, it was giving out a lot of red lights for me. So how, how can I learn more about protecting the people I'm working for? became something which is important to me. So with development, uh, I was very much keen on creating you know, things called best practices at the moment. Like we, we didn't have anything uh, a developer should follow. So I was interested on that. And then, you know, in the beginning of my career after uh, graduating, uh, I was fortunate enough to work with several visionary people uh, later became some of the global uh, widely used products like uh, Google AdMob. So I was in, in the beginning of my career as a developer, I had to look into how we can safeguard users. So that, that was sort of the infancy of Web2 or some sort of a interaction from the user to the to the site or the service. So that is how I got interested on doing security research. At the same time, like I had to find out ways how I can you know prevent attacks. Like instead of instead of doing some sort of uh, something like a reactive thing, I had to come up with like a how I can do pro that proactively, and then. I was given a scholarship to do my uh, doctoral studies, and there I started working on uh, information semantics. 
uh, and ethics of computing. So that's that's how I started. Awesome. So what what brought you into the blockchain space or specifically Ethereum? I looked into a bit uh, DLT very early on when the technology was like I I had to research on how we can create some sort of a distributed ledger kind of a technology early on. Like, uh, it was around 2012, 2013, uh, because of one of my client, a corporate client. Uh, so with that opportunity for me to work on something that is available between two different, I mean, it wasn't uh, a decentralized network, but it was more more of like a centralized network, but still uh, has some sort of a, a ledger technology. That is how I started researching on uh, the technology behind uh, Bitcoin. And then Ethereum, I started working on Solidity and stuff like that around 2018, 2019. Okay. So... Uh, I found you through La Pau Mignon. You've been working with her on a number of projects. Uh, how's that going? Oh, working with her is actually, as a developer, uh, it's almost like a dream come true because sometimes I have uh, so many experiences working with various type of people in terms of like artists and you know people like that. Uh, La Pau Mignon is, I... I mean, she's like a amazing uh, person to work with. Extremely flexible and extremely creative. Yeah, I mean, it, it has been such a privilege. Yeah, one of a kind person. And uh, in terms of uh, what we are doing, uh, we are almost ready to launch our our next uh, phase of uh, creative vision to million verse. And yeah, I, I have been working. Almost day and night to get that uh, dream uh, of us come true. Awesome. Uh, well, well, we'll probably come back to that later on. But um, if we start with what do you see as the most common ways that people are losing their NFTs and their crypto in the space at the moment? There are a lot of attack vectors going on at the moment. So I I can't say like which one is the most common way, but uh, I would say people fall victim to too much of giveaway scams and people believe too much. There, there is too much wishful thinking that, you know, I can do a quick flip or I can get something for free or I can get some important token for almost nothing and they that becomes the best attack vector. So I would say like uh, from the list, uh, it would be social engineering. So there are various type of attack vectors, right? So we have people giving approval to malicious uh, smart contract or sending Ethereum because somebody comes to you and say, oh, you know, I'm going to uh, buy a piece of art from you, but I have this uh, trade, uh, you know, I need to complete this trade. Can you send me 0.1? That, that is, even though 0.1 ETH is a very little amount at the moment, but if you think about uh, how many uh, people are getting scammed by such scams, it, it's a lot. And and then uh, the phishing links, like, you know, people get DMs. So if you're looking into Discords uh, getting hacked, uh, they replicate like popular uh, websites and then people go in and give uh, again, you know, it, it can be uh, simply compromising the wallet or uh, providing some sort of a token approval and uh, they lose the lose access to the wallet or you know, the wallet get compromised or uh, a part of it get uh, compromised and then uh, the attacker uh, has the ability to drain the wallet or just uh, you know, uh, take out uh, tokens selectively. So the first example you gave there was people sending um, money in order to receive something. Is that just buying you know, something that's complete trash or is it sending ETH to someone 
in the expectation that that's going to unlock something for them. Um, and, and then it just doesn't. Right. So uh, for the last, uh, I would say, last year or so, people were getting these DMs from quote-unquote collectors, and they claim that they have a transaction pen. You know, they, they would they would talk talk with the, uh, they would have a very nice conversation with the artist and say, like, I, I am interested on in collecting this piece. Uh, you know, this is a you know, uh, foundation uh, collection, or open sea collection, or you know, looks rare or some, somewhere. So, and then uh, they would tell the artist, "Okay, I, I would buy this piece from piece from you, but I have a pending transaction that I need to settle on foundation. I don't have enough ETH to do that." And a lot of artists fall victim to that scam. Like they don't think further than they should be. Like you know, you know, what if this person don't have enough ETH to complete this transaction? You know, why would I try to sell this to this person? Like how how can how can this person be this much you know this stuck in uh, funding? Then they they might come up with another story like they would say like you know I have this sale going through at the moment I if I settle they get the uh, I get the funding but that is not true like you, you you get the funding anyway you get you get your like let's say like somebody is buying their piece the settlement side of things are not necessary for somebody to receive their funds so you know this happens because the artist doesn't fully understand what's going on in the in the background like what what's the settlement thing what is this uh why they need extra eth so i have seen a lot of artists get uh scammed by that uh that attack vector mm, so key takeaway there is don't send anyone money if they're trying to buy something of yours i mean it seems logical that um if they can't afford to settle it or to make a transaction go through on on something that's stuck perhaps there's not enough gas in it and they haven't got enough funds to buy your art piece in the first place um so that would be an easy no i would imagine uh they they can actually make a convincing proposition because they can claim uh i have a large sale going on and they can, they they normally claim in order to finish that sale, I need to pay a gas fee. Mm. And a, normally, a real collector would never say such a thing. Like I, I have been a developer, all and also a collector. I would never say such a thing to an artist if I really love that person's art. I wouldn't ask for uh, something in return. I would try to find my own way of paying for it. So uh, I think it is quite important. Um, this this can be sometimes uh, something cultural or something like you know the artist might be struggling. Uh, they might uh, they might feel like oh if I make this sale, you know I, I can make it or <laughs> I I can make a, a a lot of money from that. So they might try to sacrifice a bit of their Ethereum to get this large sale uh, going through. So I think pe- these kind of scammers play into people's emotions, uh, you know, for more or, you know, just uh, pitching them in this kind of scammy manner. It's definitely not specific to crypto, that scam, because I think back in the early days of the internet, or not even the early days of the internet, but it's probably still going on. There was this um, the scam where there's a you know huge sum of money locked away in a bank account. I only need this much money to release it. And so it seems like it's a it's a sort of web three version of of that more web two version of of the same scam. Uh, that is true. Uh, I we, I have worked on uh, four one nine uh, Nigerian scam, and uh, that's actually web one and then web two, and now a uh, similar thing happening in web three. The thing is, during the four one nine scam. Like you would get an email saying, you know, I, I, I have inherited some sort of wealth from somewhere, somewhere, you know, would you just uh, send me this amount of money uh, to 
uh, either rescue me or either uh, you know, I need to send you money. There, there's a various uh, a set of scams uh, going through with email. But now, because of the decentralized nature of you know Web3 uh, and that people have access to paying then and there, the volume is quite high uh, and the fishers are quite Wonderful. Hmm. And I suppose you've got uh, you've got all the artists there in a sort of small area, so you could go onto a Discord. Whereas the sort of the spam side of things, you have to hit you know many many tens of thousands of people to get one score. Here, I'd imagine that the artists are more concentrated in one space, so it's easier to find people who uh, might might fall victim to this kind of thing. That's that's exactly true, and I would like to emphasize like uh, one important thing about uh, blockchain, crypto, NFT. You know, if if we really love to have this medium decentralization, or that we have the power to make a payment without a intermediary, and we have to take responsibility much more seriously like if i were if, like in 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 the real world if i'm going to use my even even virtually uh, if i'm going to pay for something using paypal or credit card or debit card if the payment is like 100 dollars i might you know i might hesitate to spend that or i might try to do a better judgment you know i whether i really need this 100 you know whether i really need to spend this 100 dollars or now, can I use it for something else? But with blockchain, with crypto, crypto wallets, that way of you know auditing ourselves is very much lacking at the moment. There is no authority who can reverse your transaction. So we have to take responsibility, especially in, in a decentralized you know, Web3 world. Yeah, very good point. Moving on to the phishing scams, so you click a link. What are the different ways that 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 can then the next step from there? So I know that in some cases you will take be taken to a fake site, and that fake site may ask you to put in your seed phrase. What other uh, versions of that um, are happening, and what other things can happen when you click on a malicious link? So you know, if if you just uh, simply uh, talk about wallet, uh, wallet security, because you know, clicking a link, uh, like all the best practices that we are supposed to follow in Web One and Web Two, uh, everyone has to you know take responsibility and do that. Like you can't, you can't simply go to a website and click a link. You have to have discipline how you use email. You know, clicking links on Discord or clicking links on Twitter. It, it's a big no no unless you know what you are what you are doing or un, unless i mean some people uh, even uh, some of the well known people in the NFC, nft space there are instances they got uh, fished into clicking links because they may have uh, searched OpenSea or looks around on google and someone w may have uh, uh, served them uh, malicious ad and you know because of that like you know there, there were uh, several instances they got up in the morning went to their mobile browser searched for Luxrea, linked on the wrong link and then got fished we have to have again going back to the point i was making earlier we have to have responsibility just because we have power to act we have to be responsible in exercising that power. So being said that, in Web3, your next line of defense is using a browser responsibly. Like there are plenty of extensions, you know, legitimate extensions released by well-known developers. And there, there are questions in that area also that I don't want to get into too much detail. but you know, you, you have various extensions that can monitor 
if you are clicking a malicious link or an unknown link and when you go into a website if you are talking only about web3 then the next line of attack can happen to your wallet so there you need to have extra security like there are a lot of people i know they would simply have a separate laptop or a separate computer to open up any links anything related to the crypto wallet i i know people who do that i i do that like i don't have uh my crypto wallet uh connected in my main uh working computer so and then you know uh, just because you you go into a website and connect your wallet uh nothing can happen because that's just it, it, it would just simply read public available data but if you provide any sort of uh, authorization it can be any sort of pop up where you have to uh, sign some sort of a transaction they are you are putting yourself in danger the wallet in danger so in terms of attack vectors we have to understand like we have to be able to read what sort of transaction that you are executing whether you are signing in or whether you are sending something you know whether you are doing some sort of a token approval so these are like the most widely used attack vectors at the moment there are other ways that well can get hacked no one is going to ask you for the uh, seed phrase that that can never happen no one needs your seed phrase uh, not, not even your grandma needs your seed phrase because you know there is nothing you can you can do to recover because you can't reset your seed phrase so if you give that out that's it no one is going to ask ask you for the private key no one and unless you know what you are doing you should never even try to expose your private key i think there's a, a an education issue here i have a, a, a some people who i who i know well who are, who've not been involved in this space at all who came to me uh some time back to say that they'd lost lost some funds um clicking on an advert on google for uh sushi swap and uh, it 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 wasn't the real website and that website did ask them for their seed phrase and they did put their seed phrase in because they thought that that was how crypto worked um and so it's you know obviously unfor- unfortunate and it, luckily it wasn't very much but um i there, there is a spectrum of skill and understanding in the computer well in the, in 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 the internet world obviously and i feel like I feel like there needs to be something that when you are starting at like first principles like first base like you're you're coming from a a a place of not understanding this technology and you know you don't understand this technology I feel like I feel like there should be something that that lets people know the the importance of a seed phrase because you know th- this particular uh, uh, couple o- honestly thought that's how it worked like that was your address like you you put that in um do you feel like there is efforts being made in the right direction by the the the, the community to 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 try and, and to try and help people i know when i used to use uh, my crypto wallet that you'd have to click through a whole range of various things to sort of show that you knew what you were doing which i suppose is is in that direction but but do you do you feel like we're going in the right direction in terms of educating people who are coming you know on board r- r- right at the beginning that that's a very good question now so i i'm with my background in security research and also i have a different competency to do with uh, cyber security i i think if we rely on someone else to teach us instead of us taking responsibility to educate ourselves we are putting this whole concept of decentralization at risk because in the same example that you you just described so there there were a couple of instances google hackers were serving google uh, malicious google adsense advertisements and like 
someone who was very uh, well known in crypto uh, space who was also a very good developer he uh, got up in the morning searched for luxrea on google instead of you know directly going into luxrea uh, and they clicked on a link they went to the look you know quote and quote luxrea website he typed in his cpf like there is no reason for a person like him to do that there's no place except if you go to your own wallet and try to restore the wallet no one would ask you for the receipt price but people can make mistakes like that but unfortunately if you do that if you have your wallet installed into your mobile device if it is easily accessible if your if your assets are uh, saved uh, stored somewhere which is easily accessible to internet there is no uh, line of defense for us just the same way like we exercised you know virus guards or best practices of you know email security or how do uh, the ways the same way we protected our our bank accounts we we have to be responsible there is there is no other way we can we can use a decentralized system like i i should not be trusting a third party to tell me uh, how the seed phrase works or how the private key works i have to do my own research that's why everyone says do your own research because somebody somewhere down the line can impersonate whether it is ledger whether it is metamask or whether it is luxrea whether it is open sea and they can send a malicious email and give you the wrong information yeah that's that's a very good point if you guys remember uh, what happened with uh, mailchimp uh, mm-hmm. one rogue employee and sent out an email compromised quite a lot of wallets uh, by doing so there, there is no other way to prevent that if all this computing technology is supposed to be making our lives much easier but at the same time that also means we have to be extremely careful i think a similar thing happened with um opensea didn't it when they were upgrading their smart contracts and then uh, and then a load of emails went out to to users of opensea um directing them to a fake site and to a malicious contract that 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 was the mailchimp attack that was the mailchimp attack okay sorry yeah yeah sure what do you think of um technology that tries to mitigate some of these things i'm thinking specifically of wallets like argent that have attempted to build in safeguards uh to do with uh being able to you know effectively create a form of 2fa in their sort of guardian smart contract tech technology you know where i have to plug in a ledger as a as a sort of guardian or i have to get another you know uh, i don't know whether it's a, a a friend or or even argent themselves or an exchange or um you 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 can create certain parameters by which the wallet will work do you feel like there there is an answer technologically in trying to help those that haven't taken enough responsibility over their own education then uh, if you go back to web 2 from the technology that we are trying to strive for the web 3 i i personally believe that if it's the purpose but it go it always goes with the saying democracy only works with uh, an educated electorate same thing goes for decentralization in order for us to protect the technology or protect the technology landscape we have to educate everybody but the 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 problem uh, is we, when we derive from the pers- permissionless system when when we step outside of that box there is no ending to how we rely upon other people to uh help us out in turn uh we can lose everything like just imagine like what that wallet that you described the way that they are describing their 
quote unquote two factor authentication or, or or you know guardian system is they allow uh, either the community or some people that you nominate has the ability to reset your wallet now what if those people that you appoint get hacked the the scale of attacks can be you know it can go far beyond that we might expect like especially with the technology that it, that might come up in the next 10 years i i don't think like there can be recovery systems that can work in the same way that we describe decentralized technology can ever exist on web 2 i i personally don't so i guess that leads us nicely on to talking about the basic steps that people should take to secure themselves you know obviously without relying on other other people or other or other technology should we should we discuss a bit about how uh people could begin to educate themselves and what what sort of what are the main elements do you see that uh, uh we should all be doing to 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 protect ourselves i think uh one of the most important thing that we have to understand about computer technology is this is just ones and zeros and if there's a device that is connected to internet or if there is a device that can be accessible via internet we should expect that can be hacked and how that can happen there are like million ways that uh, uh, an attack can go through so one important aspect one one thing i really like to advocate for people is to use a hardware wallet a, a, if you have any asset that is more valuable than buying a hardware wallet you should you should buy one for yourself and then use it in the correct way if you if you have assets that are that you are hoping to hold longer term you should move it to the hardware wallet and that is the only reason you should you like if you have crypto if you have any sort of old coins if you have uh, nfts you can simply move it to a, a hardware wallet that you keep it separately you are connecting it to your computer nothing like you are not going to sign any sort of uh smart contracts you are you are not going to give any sort of uh token approvals nothing and then whatever the interactions that you do with a smart contract you can use an a separate wallet uh, a, a metamask wallet there you need to make sure uh, you, w- one thing you can really do is to have a separate computer this is not actually i i have separate computers that i use for to access if someone sends me a document i go into that computer i spin up a, a virtual machine i check i mean this this is this might not be the most convenient way but there are things that we have to do to safeguard ourselves if i get a document even if it is even if it originates from one of my friends or one of my coworkers i would go into that uh, computer and use it to open links and once the work is done the machine get uh, the the os get destroyed that's it uh, there is nothing goes into the host laptop and then if, if you have that metamask wallet installed in you know one of those computers that you you make sure that there is no other access to it that is the wallet that you should used to interact with like if you are buying something if you are selling something that's the wallet you should always use and then if somebody sends you uh, a link let's say like somebody comes to you and say oh, i want to do a trade with an nft like i want to trade an nft you have in your uh, hardware wallet uh, how can i do it then you need to have your own way of handling it instead of letting that person tell you okay this is what i want to go to this website uh, can you list your token there i would buy it from you now that should never happen you are the one who has to dictate your terms and tell the buyer okay this is how you can buy my so i think you know 
understanding how uh, hardware wallet uh, should be used and then interact with, interacting with the rest of the world or the blockchain with a hot wallet these these things we need to start practicing and do it in the right way so uh, your suggestion would be to have a hardware wallet which is cold storage basically there for things that you're keeping for a long time for anything that yeah so that doesn't interact with smart contracts or marketplaces or anything like that the only thing perhaps it interacts with is your hot wallet and your hot wallet is say metamask and that's where you do any kind of buying and selling and or uh, any kind of smart contract integration and that a step further than that would be to do that on a separate computer which is not your normal computer and then also if you're opening any links or anything to do that in a probably that would be your normal computer rather than your crypto computer and to do that in virtual machines i suppose the tricky thing is there is lots of people don't know how to use virtual machines and that's that's a whole new set of learning that needs to happen uh i i would like to add like uh, there are services uh provided by companies like aws uh, amazon web services called workspace a workspace uh i think it cost around 20 dollars per month I, uh, i had to double check on the pricing um so it's basically a virtual computer uh that you can load up uh on any um host computer and it is a good practice uh especially since we are getting into the decentralized nature of uh, web3 to start using these kind of systems i think a person who is able to spend more than 20 dollars should you know get, get used to starting uh things like that yeah i mean i i personally do use a virtual machine for opening up any so if someone sends me something like <clears throat> that i deem as risky like a word document which occasionally happens then i will open it up in a virtual machine just to be especially careful i think that's one of the things i is that you have to not trust anything that comes in and just gap it just in case i i was going to ask is that because there is a moat between the virtual machine and 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 the host computer uh, there is a possibility that uh, your virtual computer uh, might uh, share uh, disk storage like if you have mounted uh, some sort of a disk storage to your uh, host computer the virtual computer uh the os or the software or malicious uh software can access it so using a service like workspaces that eliminates uh the possibility then and there and you can basically create a virtual machine uh with workspaces a service like workspaces with a click of a button uh and start using it that's great advice we we should probably add in just just as we were talking about hard wallets um i have heard of uh, issues in the past where people have bought second hand ones or bought ones off ebay or even amazon i i think i'd be right in saying and to get you you can correct me if i'm wrong but always go to the original website if you're buying a hard wallet because there are there are potential attack vectors there as well as as i recall that that's absolutely correct uh, there's a especially in japan there's a very well known attack this is not uh, web3 but web2 people leave their usb here and there it it used to happen uh, since the inception of usb and you know unsuspecting person might just you know get the usb and plug it in to probably uh, help the person who lost the usb like try to find a way to connect the usb into their device and then try to find some sort of a clue okay how can i return this but it, during that innocence the usb can be infected with some sort of a virus and you can lose everything so same thing goes on in terms of buying anything outside of the the real uh, manufacturer there has been attacks on certain countries even the real package that comes through 
uh, whether it is the mail or they might have uh, flipped the package. Uh, that's why if you are buying a hardware wallet, I would personally recommend go and buy it with the fastest possible uh, shipping method. And then if you are using you know, well-known hardware wallets, they have uh, a way of checking the integrity of the wallet before you start using it. And never ever buy anything, especially that can damage any of your systems on secondary market. That can be extremely dangerous. That's an interesting point about, and, and one I hadn't considered is getting it ship, shipped fast as possible. So it can't be, there's less likely to get intercepted in transit. It has happened uh, in so certain countries uh, where you know, ethics of handling this kind of shipments are questionable. So anything and everything that you don't want to lose, keep it in a hardware wallet and do not use that hardware wallet to access any sort of smart contract, any sort of exchange. Don't connect anywhere. And learn to use it with a separate computer. You can, like if it is Ledger wallet, you can use uh, the Ledger Live software and you know use that as the, connecting point and then use a hot wallet to do all your uh, normal interactions and then you can use another wallet sort of like uh, keeping the contact between the hardware wallet and the uh, widely used you know purchasing wallet and then try to just imagine like if you have any sort of uh, extremely high value assets i would even move it to a secondary hardware wallet. Some people might think I'm, you know, being excessive, but I have uh, quite a lot of hardware wallets. So I, 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 I mean, I, I basically have a hardware wallet for each type of assets that I have. So I know by doing so, a uh, hardware wallet costs you around like 150 or 180 or, you know, something around the, that, around that number, right? So if I have assets worth like millions of dollars, why shouldn't I invest on that sort of technology? So that is very important. And I guess like those are the most important things. And then the next uh, bit of uh, advice I can tell you is like when you go into your wallet, your, your hot wallet, and whenever you are interacting with a website, always watch for the message your wallet is telling you. The wallet might tell you, oh, you're sending ETH, or you're going to access this, this sort of uh, functionality. Uh, it can be mint, it can be token approval, token transfer. You know, the wallet, like the, the wallet that, that had to be compliant with the newer, newer standards, they had to give out certain amount of message, uh, certain amount of information to people who might not be like tech savvy uh, or, you know, smart contract savvy. But, you know, always pay attention to the message or the pop-up that your wallet says. Just just, just pay attention, take time, don't get uh, drive by FOMO. Just take a moment, pause and think like before you do it. That might save you a lot of headaches. Okay. And... Is that relatively clear to people when they're looking? Because um, sometimes it can be quite difficult to understand these things. It's the case of just reading the function that's actually happening. If if you go back a couple of steps, you should have uh, a, a proper password to your uh, wallet. And each time when you have finished your operations, you should lock your wallet. When you lock it, whenever you go to a website, the first thing that you have to do is unlock it. There you have to give your password and make sure that you you always have a very strong password. And also remember, if you have any sort of keylogger installed in your computer, this is one of the times you can get compromised. So even though this is not a direct attack, just because somebody knows your password and they don't know your private key or seed phrase, they can really do... They can't, they can't really do an attack. This is actually for ourselves to make sure that we 
we are not going to execute a transaction without, you know, we are not going to use our volatility. And then that is one of the best practices. Use your hot wallet the right way. I know a lot of people don't do that. The second thing is read the pop-up. Like you go to a website, you click the connect button and read the message. Check if it is asking for your public information or whether it is asking for further permission than just reading your public information. A website that has the connect button should never need anything other than your public wallet address. You know, nobody needs anything other than that. So knowing that, I think, can prevent a lot of attacks. And then once you have successfully connected your wallet to a website, and if it only reads your public data, and even if it is a malicious website, you are not going to get hacked or you are not going to get compromised because it's only reading the publicly available data. Now the second step, you see a claim button or you see a mint button, what would you do? If you click on any of those buttons and if the wallet says something, now this is the time that you should pay attention. It might tell you, you are trying to do this sort of a transaction. Now, I would advocate against using the mobile version of your hot wallet because I think still we are in the infancy of this technology. Like, you know, a lot of uh, smart contracts still doesn't allow you to mint uh, using mobile. I personally don't mint via mobile unless it is extremely safe. I don't advocate using mobile because that is uh, one of the ways you can make mistakes. You may not see. Uh, all the information related to the transaction that you are going to commit because your mobile uh, device might not show you all the information that you have to audit, you have to verify from a transaction that you are going to execute. So I would always advocate to use your PC to carry out the transaction. So. Just get up from your bed or your sofa. Just go to your computer and do it there. And read what you are going to sign. Always check for that information. Whether I'm going to send Ethereum to somebody. Like if you are minting something from a smart contract, that would never tell you that you are going to send Ethereum. So if you are expecting to mint a token on a smart contract, but then your your wallet says, "Oh, you are going to you are about to send Ethereum," you are definitely getting scammed. That's that's a red flag. I mean, there are various ways that people can uh, get scammed because you know there can be a, a huge knowledge gap between a typical collector or or a newbie collector or even even a very experienced collector and a developer. As much as I would like to advocate everybody having uh, some sort of a education of how we can use this technology, developers also has to adhere. There are, you know, people who are trying to scam people uh, as devs, and then there are, you know, devs who are trying to do a good job but still don't practice best practices, and then there are devs who are extremely transparent about everything that the collector is going to do with the uh, smart contract. So we need to look into projects like that and invest on those projects. But the unfortunate reality is uh, most of the people in NFT space is trying to make a quick flip and Try to make a lot of money quickly, and unfortunately, they get uh, attacked in the same way. Um, I have a question. Actually, it relates back to the hardware wallets. When you say have a separate hardware wallet for each asset, potentially or asset class, would just having a secondary address on that wallet cover it? Because that because 
if you're going to be signing something on one contract, it wouldn't sign it across multiple wallets. Or do you actually have to physically have a separate hardware? Is there any benefit in physically having a separate hardware wallet um, with a different seed? Uh, the benefit would be uh, basically you are limiting the amount of interactions that you do with that asset class. So let's say like I have 100 ETH in one wallet and then I have a board ape in another wallet. So I would never risk both of them in the same time. That's that's basically the reason. Yeah, so so having having just a wallet number two but on the same hardware wallet or under the same seed would, would do that job then? Uh, no. Because if... Because it's the same physical device. If one get compromised, yeah, exactly what George said. Uh, if one get compromised, because the thing is like, uh, I I know what you're trying to say, like, you know, the wallet and the account, two different things. But yeah. if, if because the seed phrase is for, one, the, for the wallet, not for the account, private key is for the account. So if, if I, if one of my private key go, uh, get compromised, I can probably try to not to use that, uh, account again but if the seed phrase get compromised or if the the only way that would happen would be on as a physical attack if someone actually came to your house and actually got hold of your your hardware wallet is that right oh there are some people who take a picture and send it to their email <laughs> oh well yes i mean <laughs> that's a whole different subject isn't it <laughs> So that's one of like that's how a number of people have been compromised by storing their seed on Google Drive or Dropbox or and then having their email account. Right, um, which which sort of does bring on the point about complexity. And sometimes I feel like there's the possibility that I'm my own worst enemy when it comes to security because I've overcomplicated my security. And and you know you you might be you know, chopping bits of paper up and putting them in different places and then forgetting where those places are. Or there, there, there has to be some balance, doesn't there, but between uh, making it so that it's manageable and then making it so that you're actually not uh, causing issues to yourself. I guess, I guess finding out where that balance is is, is tricky. That is true. I mean, I, I, I would say uh, in the beginning, best approach should be using at least one hardware wallet and then two uh, hot wallets. Uh, a wallet that you connect only to your hardware wallet and then another hot wallet that you would use for interacting with the smart contracts and things like that. So three different wallets uh, kept separately. I think that is a start everybody can get used to. How would you go about backing up you know securities um, so as george said you know it's very easy to become your your own worst enemy and glassnode estimates that 3 million bitcoin um which is a significant amount of the supply are lost forever through either sending to the wrong address or by losing seeds what ways can people defend against themselves i i think this is a very tricky <laughs> tricky field that i can't give a good uh answer because it can also work into the like gray area where people can also get hacked uh but what i would say is uh, let me tell you like how i do it i have some of my hardware wallets in at a bank i have a safe deposit box i have them stored there a very reputed bank uh and then i have the papers uh the the uh seed traces stored another place so that is one way to safeguard the hardware wallet and then in terms of like backing up and security you need to definitely store like i i know uh, people who may have lost their seed phrase because they may have had a flood or fire or something like that and then they may have kept all seed for the all those uh paper the written uh, seed phrases at the same place or same house. You can try to find somebody who is reliable enough. I don't know, uh, a grandmother, somebody like that, and uh, keep a copy 
uh, outside of your house. We have to come back again to that same point. Uh, I was keep on keep on repeating. We have to take responsibility, and how we do it, it has to be our own way. We can't basically follow how everybody else do it, and also, like I I know my mother would never scam me, and even if she does, I I can't I can't. Uh, go back and say okay you you did this. so i i'm i am perfectly fine for her to use my seed phrase and i am i'm pretty sure she doesn't understand what seed phrase ah but still so for me she's a good source of uh security so you know we need to find our own way how we are going to back up this stuff and one way we should never back up is in our, our computer that is for sure is that does that include within not even in a locked vault on your computer or within a password manager for example that i cannot advocate because there is no easy security there and we if you are going to rely on a service like that the bigger your crypto stash going to be you can be vulnerable to attacks I I cannot I cannot advocate in God good conscience that any relate any technology related solution because anything that is connected to internet anything that is on a computer we should expect to get hacked I I would challenge that and I would say that I think that storing your seed in a digital format it doesn't necessarily have to be on a computer that you use a lot or that is connected to the internet when you put it on there is safer than having your seed written down in physical form anywhere um so for example if you if you had your seed at your mother's house written on a piece of paper then someone could stumble upon it or could get accidentally you know or maybe they were stealing a stealing a book or something you know you could stumble upon that piece of card written stashed in a book and it, it could be accidentally stumbled upon well you can uh, this is this is for as an example imagine you have ledger cards you can you can easily uh, break into two pieces and store in at two places and and what if your computer stops working how many computers have you had that have just died i've had three yep yeah, yeah but you have to have multiple versions in multiple okay. places off site on site but all digital is that what you're saying uh, well well what if you had half the seed digitally on a usb stick and that was paired with the other half which was written down and then you swapped the other side round and did it the other way around for the other side so there's always a pair together but one half is digital and one half is physical i tend to not trust circuitry as much as bits of paper but <laughs> but i guess this comes to to gatchy's point that that you have to be you have to think about it and you have to make your own decisions and then you have to be comfortable with those with those decisions the fact that if you've come this far down the rabbit hole by the time you're trying to work out you know where you're going to put you know your hard you're you're already come a long way from just keeping a lot of stuff on a hot wallet somewhere and clicking links all over the place so um i get i guess it's good to get into those kinds of details but but um it would be good for to have though to bring more people down down this deep to have these conversations so i i i had a i i have a friend um who had a flood uh in australia probably a couple of months ago he had a hardware wallet and he had those i mean i i'm the one who recommended him to buy the hardware wallet and so he 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 did everything and then uh he wrote down those piece of papers and stored in the same house which got flooded and he lost everything yeah offsite backup is very important i i i, I would say um so this is i i, I don't agree with uh, what you are saying in terms of technology uh, i don't have anything against uh you know if you know how to do it you know go for it that's perfectly fine but in terms of 
best practices, you should never ever store your seed phrase related data off your hardware device on a computer. That just defeats the purpose of using hardware wallet. You should find ways to store the seed phrase in a meaningful manner outside of your house for sure. I mean, it can be a safe uh, that that, a, that has uh, flood protection. I mean, there, there are safes that, that, that doesn't, I mean, water doesn't penetrate, penetrate into uh, certain safes. You can use those kind of uh, safes. But it is good to have a different plan. It can be your grandmother, it can be your mother, it can be somewhere else, it can be a bank safe. It, but then again, you can't store the same seed phrase at the same place. That, that is, that, I mean, that is, uh, that is not rocket science. That is just basics. So you you need to you need to find your own rhythm and way. There, there's a there's a part here that where it begins to get a little more complicated, and and that's to do with um, death and moving one's assets onto the next generation, um, because if you have you know been very secure in how you do it the knowledge of how to gain access might stop with you and then you end up in a very strange situation where um you might have to trust someone else to know the coordinates of how to put back together your assets um i'm guessing there are different ways of doing that and there might be ways of doing it where there aren't, there isn't trust involved, whereby you know, maybe there's a safety deposit box with instructions in, and the the there's a certain sort of next of kin that can gain access to that safety to deposit deposit box. But I suppose this this is another part of the thinking that needs that needs to happen, especially if you have you know significant sums of of crypto. Um, so, 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 what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts in that direction? Is there a is there a best practices to take it all the way through to inheritance? Uh, that 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 is actually a very good question. That I haven't. Uh, besides sharing my information, if I if I talk personally, besides sharing my information related to the you know seed phrases and stuff like that with my next in uh, who who has to inherit. I haven't thought much into uh, a solid solution that requires permissionless uh, transfer of assets because there are ways that that can get compromised. But I think one of the things that I I was like there there were there were solutions like with um, emails that happened like probably around twenty years ago. Um, I used to know a friend who had a system where it has a self-destructing mechanism he, he wrote into it where password of the email address would go to a certain person whether it is a relative or a sibling or somebody if he doesn't uh, go into a system and say uh, i am still alive i believe that's called a dead man switch right so i think that is something we may need to look into something in the form of a smart contract because I, 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 I write a lot of smart contracts uh, and like to experiment with, uh, with those. Uh, a dead man switch, as uh, Luke described, would be a good solution. So, but it should never be in the control of a, another third party. I have to do it. So let's say like, you know, every month, I need to go to a smart contract and say, I need to sign something and say, like, I'm still alive. So if that doesn't happen, I can assign somebody with a wallet. I can give them, you know, you know let's go and create your own, own wallet. Whether it, it can be my uh, significant other or sibling or somebody. And educate them about the system. And tell them, also about how, you know, what are the best practices, and then do the smart contract. I think that is uh, one way to approach this because even if you have lost access to a wallet, 
and if you have that sort of a dead message it can automatically trigger after a month or so and you get uh, assets into a different location yeah it's a very interesting idea i've been looking for dead man switches or good services that that supply them and um the 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 only one that i found that is remotely usable is an email based one and it's not encrypted in any form your messages are not stored encrypted so you'd have to find a way to in using an email based one and of course email's not secure anyway um have to find a way of passing on a message that's going to perhaps be a password to something they already own maybe they have uh, actually, no, because then that would be just storing it digitally. When I'm thinking about storing something digitally and USB keys, giving someone a USB key, but not giving them the password and maybe giving the password via a dead man switch. It's not an ideal solution, but uh, trying to think around different ways that you could create redundancy in a system. And I think that's probably a different problem with digitally stored things, if, if nothing's stored in a digital format, then that's a different story. One good uh, solution for this kind of a uh, uh, dead man switch can be a multi-signature wallet. Now, multi-signature wallet wallets are quite widely used by uh, high-value uh, smart contracts or high-value projects uh, as means to limit any sort of malicious attacks via one, sing one single wallet. So. It can be people uh, who you would assign, uh, basically, who can be close to you, but you know they are directly interacting with a wallet. They are just signing a transaction that pass your assets into a different wallet uh, in case of a death or uh, fire or anything like that. Okay, yeah, I mean, I could see that if that was an Ethereum wallet, that could end up being very expensive if you've got you know a couple of hundred NFTs you'd need enough funds ready in order to move that um, that amount. And if there was happened to be like an ICO happening at the time or or some kind of auction of land, for example, uh, which has peaked the gas price really high, then that might cause a sub substantial problem. Right. I guess you can plan mitigations to that. Or maybe, maybe we'll have uh, Ethereum 2.0 and... We'll have solved all of our problems by then. <laughs> yeah, but uh, at the same time, there are solutions that we can, uh, as developers, we can write into to move assets uh, in bulk, and you know, giving to different token approvals and stuff like that. And also, yeah, the merge is coming, so probably August or September, we should see Ethereum moving into layer, layer two. Do you think that's going to have a an instant effect on uh, gas prices? I, I I would say so. Well, that's definitely something to look forward to. Here's hoping, absolutely. And uh, recently, the gas prices has been quite low. Last week, the gas fee was nine quay. So <laughs> that was uh, uh, something to look at. Well, well, this has been a fantastic chat, and we've, we've sort of run out of time. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on anything that we've covered today, or anything that you'd like to leave us with? I think uh, one of the key things I would like to emphasize is try to read a little bit about uh, crypto security or wallet security. We have to go back to the times that we were suspicious about the internet and we have to always try to uh, follow the best practices that involves not trusting anyone with any sort of link, even your closest friend can get uh, hacked and uh, the attacker can send you some sort of a link to compromise your wallet. So always make sure to check several times and find ways to keep on reading. I, I think education has to be the front running thing that people have to go back to and do. Read it all the time. Great. Thanks, Tagashi. Great to talk to you. It was my pleasure.